The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program, depending on their content. Now I'd like to present to you um, the Fountain of Time. So this is more a little bit of the background of the project instead of restoration of it. It's also originally known as the Passing on Time, but as most people know it is as the Fountain of Time. And it was inspired um, by Austin Dobson's 1877 poem, Time Goes, You Say, Oh no, alas, time stays, we go. So, Lorado Taft, who was born in 1860 and passed in 1936, was the kind of artist to take this on. A Chicago sculpture of monumental heroic subjects. He, um, and this is an image of him in 1887. He was a native to Illinois. And he really inspired women um, to be in sculpting, it was noted. And he also established Eagle's Nest Art Colony, and he taught at the Art Institute of Chicago. So he's a sculpture writer, University of Illinois alumnus, a self-proclaimed art missionary. Taff led the field of American sculpture for a half of a century. From the late 1880s through the 1930s, he erected major public monuments across America from Seattle to Denver and also in Washington, D.C. His articles and lectures shaped the public's understanding of art. His instruction at the Art Institute of Chicago molded the careers of Midwestern artists. And his academic textbook, The History of American Sculpture, remains one of the foundational texts on American art history. His impact was profound but not limited to his home state in Illinois, but particularly in Chicago, where the sculpture, sculptor rose to pr prominence during the World's Columbian Exposition. He's installed many of his greatest masterpieces there. The Fountain of the Great Lakes and the Fountain of Time are both in Chicago. And he established, also established the legendary Midway Studios, which is now part of the University of Chicago. This is an image of um, Taft sculpting a clay portrait of Colonel Briggs in the upper right. Um, he also, his two sisters are also in this image. His sisters, uh, Turba, drawing the portrait of Charles Francis Brown in the front center. And Zulaim sculpting a woman's portrait on the left. And this image was taken in 1896. He was also known for um, doing the full-scale uh, model of the standard bearer of the 4th Michigan Infantry Regiment for Gettysburg. And this was photographed in 1888, and it's on the right. And on the left is what the final work um, looked like. Now, it has been, he has been quoted in writings that even though he did this work, he wasn't very proud of it because it wasn't as free-flowing as what he was used to for his other works. Um, beneath the full-size plaster uh, model of the Fountain of the Great Lakes, um, Taft enjoyed presiding over meals at a large table in the main room of the Midway Studio Complex. Artists, friends, students, and occasionally a pet were among those who gathered on these occasions. So during the Midway project, he was hired to start uh, the sculpture of the Fountain of Time. And in, in those days, the artists would first do a small-scale sculpture, and they would do it in plaster. And then they, from there, they would be commissioned to do a full-sized um, sculpture from that. Uh, he was hired to do that for $50,000, which was quite a large amount of money. And that helped him uh, get his uh, artists within his group to be able to learn their trade of sculpting. 
So this is an image um, after the, the small scale had been approved and they had been approved to do the full scale of Catherine Engel sculpting a full scale of clay model in Taft's Fountain of Time. And this was taken in 1921. In 1920, when the plaster model was complete, Taft began seeking a way to put it into permanent form on the chosen site. It had grown so long, so high, so complicated, that I couldn't even get a bid on the carving of it, according to Taft. I did not care to put it into bronze. My thought had been stone, or something similar to stone. I began to make inquiries to see whether a thing as complicated as this could be made in concrete. And then he goes on to say, a friend referred Taft to the U.S. Bureau of Standards in Washington. The staff there in turn referred him to John J. Early, who had developed a, pro a procedure for introducing color and texture into concrete surfaces with exposed aggregate, as we have learned today. Although the idea of removing cement paste from the surface of the concrete to reveal the inherent natural colors of the aggregate was not original with Early, he had already perfected this process at Meridian Hill Park in Washington and elsewhere. And as we've also learned today, um, the early method um, included gap grading aggregates and brush wash techniques. So the proposal started of getting this cast because the bids came in so high for it to be in granite. So that's why they went to stone because it was going to be um, completely out of the price range that they had predicted. In addition to that, uh, Taft's uh, popularity in the community was starting to go down at this time. If you think of this time for artists, it was, uh, they were becoming much more modern art that was becoming very popular, um, like Van Gogh, uh, Monet, and those kind of things. So as his um, popularity was waning, he started to looking um, more into getting this completed in a very timely manner for a large art project in this. So a proposal was made with the starting collaboration of what was to become a technical as well artistic triumph. So as you see in this image, the continuous human wave of 120 feet long, 18 feet high, and 14 feet wide called for a mold too large and complicated to be filled by normal methods and forming and casting too large to be made solid. Thus the core needed, which would greatly follow the configuration of the mold at the right distance from it to regulate the thickness of the concrete and to keep it in place in contact with the mold during the setting process. As we heard earlier, they, um, this is how they also wick the water in Jenna's presentation that they needed to um, take the excess moisture out of the um, concrete. There was also concern about water collecting in the hollows among the figures. Basil Taylor, a civil engineer and associate at the early studio, solved the problem by thinking of the entire structure as a building with a foundation, first story and a roof. The roof was built as high as possible, but below a level at which the figures met in the continuous mass. It was pitched towards the center and drained by downspouts. The figures formed a parapet which extended above the roof as the second story. They were arbitrarily divided into 26 sections, each of a size estimated to contain as much concrete as could be placed in a normal day of a work by efficient crew. Joints between the sections were always vertical and were um, located in recessed locations. The bottom image on the left is from the original article um, that they had. It shows some of the formwork. I know the quality isn't the best, so that's why I added the other images on this slide for you. But the bottom left-hand corner. The base of the statue presented no unusual forming problems, but because of the extreme irregularity of the figures and myriad of forms presented, the mold had to be designed in hundreds of pieces, each of which could be easily removed after casting. They were made of plaster of Paris, heavily reinforced with jute fiber and two inch iron pipe. The smallest pieces were only 12 inches across. The largest, however, was about two and a half by four feet and weighed over a thousand pounds. In all, there were over 4,500 pieces. This mold would set a record as the largest plaster piece mold ever fabricated. To make the core, which was to establish the thickness of the concrete and to keep in contact with the mold, the model was surveyed and contour shapes were cut from wood and erected on the base of the statue. These were covered with metal lath and coated of cement mortar made of one part cement, 
to two parts of building sand. The mortar was applied to the lath with a pointing trowel with no attempt to compact it. It was described as a lean mix and hard to apply, but it created a very poor space well suited to the work it was intended to do so. When the core was completed, the vertical timbers were attached to the base by bolt screws into sockets provided for that purpose. The timbers were connected to each other across the top of the joist. They were formed, supports against the molds was braced, and be, uh, attached to the concrete base were better than supports set in the soft soil around the fountain. They also served as pole derricks to which the workers attached rigging and by which they hosted all the molds and materials. And in the bottom, or the left-hand side image, you could um, see some of that rigging. Um, this also has an image um, showing the rigging in the bottom um, image and some of the images of the rest restored project. The concrete mix, of course, had to be of color and texture that were acceptable to TAF. Um, John Early proposed a mixture of crushed Potomac River gravel with um, particles ranging in color from white to yellow to brown. He explained that this was a 100-foot concrete, that is, the mix was planned so that the particles on the surface would blend to give an appearance of uniform color and texture when viewed from 100 feet away. We don't know his mix proportions, but we do know some of the performance demands placed on that concrete. Early told some of his concerns, quote, in order that the concrete might feel so complicated a mold, it was necessary to mix it very soft. In order that it might not shrink away from the dome-like surface of the mold, it was necessary to mix it very stiff. This difficulty was overcome by bringing about change in consistency while the concrete was in the mold. The core was so constructed that it would extract the excess water, but at the same time leave sufficient amount of hydrate water for hydration of the cement. Although the most important parts of the work, such as the head's arms, were on the top of the molds, the most difficult position to fill, the concrete showed no tendency to shrink away from the mold owing to the extreme density developed when the excess water was extracted." End quote. Early's mix also had to develop strength rapidly to re permit removal of the mold and expose the aggregate before the concrete was fully hardened. Only after brushing and washing to remove the surface skin of the paste would the plain color and texture of the emerge. This is uh, one of the original photos uh, right after it was open. At the completion of the work, the sculpture um, reminisced afterward, quote, and this is Taff, um, the men began making the mold about a year ago, the winter of 1921 to 1922, in zero weather in Chicago. They were under a shed. Sometimes they did not notice that the shed was there. It was a trying time, but they made, th made it through to the summer. The good work went on. They spent six months making the mold, you can imagine my emotion when they began to fill those things, fit those things together and pour it. They did it so differently from the way I should have done it. They had so many considerations that never had occurred to me. Steel congestion inside, things like that. But I just accept them without question. And when we got the result, it combined two great qualities." End quote. These qualities were the distinct color and texture achieved by exposing the natural aggregate placing on the concrete. So carefully planned and studied was accomplished without a hitch. The 26 pores into which the work was divided were completed on schedule during the summer and the work was dedicated November 15, 1922. The Fountain of Time was hailed as an artistic triumph for the sculpture, Lorado Traft, and equally as a splendid embodiment of John Early's exposed aggregate technique so admirably showcased in the gigantic monument. And this is an image of uh, a Chicago community uh, when they had the opening unveiling of it. The one thing to point out, they expected, uh, it looks like several, pe large number of people are at the uh, photo, but they cropped the picture to show that by this time the Chicago community wasn't backing Taft on the sculpture any longer, and it was deemed uh, unsuccessful. And so we're only starting to appreciate it today, uh, I think, or in the, should I say not in Taft's time did he realize, uh, didn't get to have the great quality of it. A postcard that was made. 
and then I just wanted to share a few images with you. The tw um, Father of Time's in the front. He's a 26-foot-tall statue. And some of the images the community uh, didn't like due to their more Romanesque, or should I say not fully clothed, so the nudity was bothering some of the community. Um, in addition to it was too classical of a look, uh, than what the community was going towards at the time. They wanted more modern type of look. So at the very end, um, I have recently found that it was restored for $2 million of restoration for the fountain and the reflecting pool and the statue portion of it and this was done in 2002 and it was noted that um, Fountain of Time sculpture unveiled on the Midway and this was posted November 19th 2002. In the last few weeks one gem of the Hyde Park landscape has returned to view the 1922 monument of the Fountain of Time by Lorado Taft. A well-known American artist and former Hyde Park resident has been unveiled at the west end of Midway after an extensive restoration. And that's just one of the images. I'd like to thank you, and I also would like to thank um, Mary Hurd and Larry Rowland for the use of some of their images, and then Kansas State University and G.E. Johnson for funding to present this to you.